Hello and welcome back to the virtual classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Olmsted. Today's topic is Lecture 24, Slavery and Manifest Destiny. Now before we begin, as always, take a quick moment, hit pause on this video, jot down the lecture outline, and pay particular attention to those key terms at the top. Make sure you can identify the who, what, where, when, and why. Be able to connect them to each other and to their larger historical significance. Now that you got that, let's get started. Now, before, say, the 1840s, the vast, vast, vast majority of all Americans lived east of the Mississippi River. It was only in the 1840s that they began to really push beyond the boundaries of the Mississippi. And they began to form a kind of a new justification for doing so. It came under the guise of what's called manifest destiny. This is a term I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Now, manifest destiny refers to this conviction that it was, you know, the white culture, the white country, the United States' culture and superior institution, along with their God-given rights, to spread across the continent. In other words, the United States Americans believed that because their culture, because of their race was superior, it was their God-given right, nay, their obligation to spread their superior culture from sea to shining sea. And this is, of course, this very famous image that many students should recognize that really vividly portrays this idea of manifest destiny. Of course, what you see here is everything's moving from, well, east to west, from right to left on your screen. And of course, you see that, first of all, you have the angel moving the Americans westward. So again, led by God. The Bible in one hand, technology in the other, again, superior institution, technology, the um, telegraph. Of course, you see the boats, the steamboat in the east. You see them bringing farming, civilized farming, you know, civilized farming, to the west. Of course, who's already there? The Indians. And of course, they're moving from lightness into darkness because supposedly there's darkness and savagery. And of course, they got to tame the Wild West. Of course, you see the Indians there who some will argue they're, you know, cowering in fear. Others might argue that, well, they are beckoning for the Americans to come and show them proper white living. Now, the, what is not seen in this picture, of course, is the issue of slavery. But slavery is very much going to overlap with this idea of manifest destiny. Now, again, we're starting here in 1840, basically. But by this point, the United States, the North and the South, had contained their differences over slavery for about 60 years, ever since the, con the Constitutional um, Compromise. Back at the Compromise of 1787, the Great Compromise, that is. And of course, every time a new state came into the Union, this question over slavery would rise again. We talked about it already back with the Missouri Compromise of 1820. And of course, back then, the idea was, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to admit Missouri is a slave state, thanks to Henry Clay. Also admit Maine is a free state to maintain senatorial balance. And we're going to extend that a line, a fictive line, called the 3630 parallel, that will forever solve this issue. Well, in many respects, all this is is kicking the can down the road again. Just like the Great Commerce of 1787, it was kicking the can down the road, not dealing with the real problem, the moral issue of enslaving another race of human beings. And so while the Missouri Compromise, like the Great Compromise, will solve the problems for a short time, the problems arise again in the 1830s. And of course, in 1836 was the gag rule that will essentially keep the country together until 1844. When that ends, though, and one of the reasons why these compromises always seem to work, and again, there's numerous reasons, but one of the big reasons is, was the two-party system in the United States politically. In other words, in, in 1787, in 1820, in the 18, you know, even 1830s, 
there was what was called the two-party system in America. In other words, there were two major political parties, but these were not regional parties. Rather, they were had national broad appeal. So you could be a Democrat or Republican or later Democrat and live in either Massachusetts or Alabama. Likewise, you could be a Whig and you could live in either New York or Georgia. And because of this, you voted based on your political ideology, big versus small government, not on the basis of your regional ideology of slavery versus no slavery. So it works. But everything changes in 1840s. And I know how much Texans love to be egotistical and tell themselves bigger than they really are, but it really kind of begins right here in Texas. So the brief history of Texas, again, very small. In the 1820s, early 1830s, the new Mexican government, who had overthrown their Spanish oath in 1821, they began to invite U.S. whites into Texas to help shore up their northern line and help develop that part of the country. Again, there were very few people living here. In fact, there were about only 5,000 Tejanos, in other words, Mexicans who lived in what is now Texas. There were a number of Native Americans, but 5,000 for this vast northern region of Mexico was not very many. And as a result, the Mexican government wanted some help developing the land, so they invited in U.S. whites, which is fine. And of course, they made rules for them. You know, you have to abide by Mexican laws because you're living in Mexican territory. And of course, the white Americans said, yeah, 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 whatever. And by the 1830s, there are now 15,000 white Americans, 1,000 slaves, which is important because the reality is back in 1821, when the Mexican government created a new constitution, the first constitution, they outlawed slavery. Slavery was not allowed in Mexico. Mexicans were against slavery. And yet these 15,000 white Americans brought the institution with them against the wishes of the Mexican government. Again, big no-no, disrupting the sovereignty of a independent nation. Well, of course, you all know the story if you're from Texas. In 1836, there was a big thing where the Mexican government warned the cannon from Goliath. They said, come and take it. There's a massacre there. And then, of course, there was the Alamo on March 6, 1836, where a bunch of Americans died trying to defend the small Spanish fort. And of course, the big battle came at San Jacinto when the Texans did surprise General Santa Ana and force him to surrender and give up Texas. And so in 1836, Texas becomes independent. Now, here's the thing, though. The president in 1836 was still Andrew Jackson. And the people of Texas, these white Americans who fought for independence, they had no real interest in being an independent nation. They wanted to be annexed by the United States to become a state. The problem was the age-old problem of senatorial balance for slave versus free states. Texas wanted to be a slave state. And in 1836, there were already 13 free and 13 slave states. Thus, Texas would upset the Senate balance. First problem. Second problem is Andrew Jackson rightfully realized that Texas was a unstable economic failure waiting to happen. Again, they're a brand new nation, if you will. Just fought a war for independence. They are financially unstable. And do you really want to invite that level of economic uncertainty into your country, especially when, if it goes awry, this means involvement of the U.S. government. Remember, Andrew Jackson, Democrat, believes in small government. Do you really want to risk expanding government to help Texas? Second problem. And the third problem was that despite Santa Ana's concession to you know, surrender, the, Mexican, the rest of the Mexican government was not happy with this and did not really recognize the independence of Texas. And thus, if you annex Texas as the United States, you risk a war with Mexico. Do you really want that? And again, Andrew Jackson says, no, you don't want to risk that. That's an expansion of government. And so for these three main reasons, 
Andrew Jackson says no, and Texas then, of course, becomes independent for 12 years in their own nation, the Lone Star State. Now, why does all this matter? Well, it matters because Texas, after 1836, was kind of a forgotten thing in the United States. But it came back to headlines in 1844. Why? The accidental president, John Tyler. Remember him? He was the guy who was supposedly a Whig, was vice president under William Henry Harrison. And then when Harrison died two weeks after taking office, he took over and they found out only afterward he was not really a Whig. He just hated Andrew Jackson. Well, he served the four years that were supposed to be William Henry Harrison's. In 1844, he's up for re-election hour for election hour on his own accord. And he's searching for a party because the Whigs won't take him because he's not really a Whig. And at the same time, the, Demo the Democratic Party won't take him because he's not, he hated Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson is the father of the Democratic Party. And so he wants to create a national issue that people can rally behind to give him some popularity and get some party to back him for president. And so he calls for the annexing of Texas as this national issue under Manifest Destiny to make this the national issue to win support for either the Democratic Party or the Whig Party so they will take him and push him to be president for more years. Well, despite this fact, despite that people actually did agree with John Tyler on this issue, both parties reject him. Instead, the, Whig, the Whigs will select Henry Clay, our old friend, and the Democratic Party will select James K. Polk. And both Whig and Democrat alike both support the annexing of Texas and Oregon as national issues under the guise of manifest destiny. Now, Polk is going to win the election. Again, poor Henry Clay. But before he can even take office, Tyler resolves the question of Texas. In the last months of, of his tenure in office, the outgoing President John Tyler pushed through Congress what is called a joint resolution that would admit Texas to the United States to the Union. Now, unlike a treaty, a joint, uh, unlike a treaty which needs a two-thirds majority in the Senate, which Tyler did not have, he's very unpopular. A joint resolution only needed majority support, simple majority. And that, because Texas was an issue that people rallied around, Texas was able to join the Union in 1844. And one more thing, Texas was given the ability to join the Union and split into five smaller states if it chose to do so. Again, can you imagine? Instead of being the second biggest state in the country, Texas was split into five smaller states. Very interesting idea. But nonetheless, James K. Polk wins a narrow election over Henry Clay. He'll be the next president, and he'll be the one who will deal with the fallout of John Tyler's decision. And of course, once Mexico learns of te Texas's annexation by Tyler and later Polk, it will promptly sever diplomatic ties and the new president, James K. Polk, will send General Zachary Taylor down to the border. You see where the arrows are at there. And he will station troops right in the northern side of the Rio Grande, the traditional border between Texas and Mexico. So October 1845, General Zachary Taylor, along with 40, I'm sorry, along with 3,500 U.S. troops, reached the Nueces River, just north of the Rio Grande. And Polk is not trying to provoke a war here. What he wants to do is show this strong military presence, hoping it will convince Mexico to make a diplomatic concession, a treaty, some kind of peaceful agreement. Mexico basically calls a bluff and doesn't do anything. And when Mexico doesn't go for this bluff, this show of force, President Polk orders Zachary Taylor to go south of the Rio Grande into Mexico. 
I'll repeat that. President Polk, after Mechville called his bluff, ordered General Zachary Taylor and 3,500 U.S. troops to go south of the Rio Grande into Mexican territory. This is by definition an act of war. Then what happened was a small skirmish that resulted in 16 American deaths, again on Mexican soil. Nonetheless, Polk quickly drafts a war message to Congress, claiming that Mexico had, quote, passed the boundary of the United States, invaded our territory, and shed American blood on American soil. War exists, notwithstanding all our efforts to avoid it. It exists by an act of Mexico, unquote. So Polk flat out lies. This is not the first time. This definitely won't be the last time that the president has lied about a skirmish over against a foreign power. Vietnam, weapons of mass destruction, etc. But Congress's declaration of war will bitterly divide Americans. Whigs, including Abraham Lincoln, will question, rightfully so, Polk's truthfulness. In addition, Polk made it very clear that while Texas was the current issue at hand, any war must also include New Mexico, Arizona, and California, which back then was called the New Mexican Territory and the California Territory. And so they wanted, when it came to resolving this crisis with Mexico, they wanted it all. Not just Texas, they wanted it all. Now, as the rest of the story goes, this is a very one-sided war. And as you can see by the map, not only do we infiltrate in California, we will infiltrate down further into Mexico, and of course we will send our troops down into Veracruz. Our troops will land, they will march across the country, and they will invade Mexico City, the capital of Mexico. And very quickly, by, by 1847, we now control in the start of September of 1846, by 1847, the war is over. We are standing in Mexico City. And the question becomes now, how much territory do we want? What do we want to force Mexico to give up? And the reality is, while the initial conversation was Texas, New Mexico, California, there was actually discussion about why stop there? Remember, we're standing in Mexico City. We've taken their capital. And at one point, there is actual maps in the archive that show the line way down there at the bottom, just south of Mexico City. In other words, we will take Mexico City for our own. And there's two problems with this and why we did not. The first problem was that Mexico was not fighting a fair war against the United States. Because the reality was we were not the only ones they were fighting. They were also fighting guerrilla-style insurgents in their own country who were upset with the current government. And our generals in Mexico City said, uh, Mr. President, you may want Mexico City, but we are not equipped or prepared to fight a war against guerrilla-style warfare. We will lose. The second big issue was the issue of slavery. The reality is there were 7 million people, seven, sorry, let me rephrase it, there were 7 million Mexicans from Mexico City northward. That is 7 million Mexicans who would vote against slavery. And senators like John C. Calhoun said no go. Southern politicians, Southern representatives, congressmen, will never agree to any Mexican resolution with 7 million abolitionists. And so they said, fine, let's move them a little further north, up to um, Buena Vista. And once again, the problem here, there were still almost 3 million Mexicans living north of this line. And again, John C. Calhoun raised the alarm saying, no, this is not going to happen. This is too many people voting against slavery. And so, of course, finally we get to the point where we draw the boundary where it currently is, using the Rio Grande and then northward across Southern California, New Mexico, Arizona. Because the difference is when we get to that boundary line, there's only somewhere between 75 and 100,000 Mexicans who would vote against slavery. 
Yeah, there's Indians there too, but again, we don't care much about them. And so the war is over. On February 2nd, 1848, the United States and Mexico will sign the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. It will give the United States a whole bunch more land. It will essentially somewhat settle the boundary to our current boundaries of the Rio Grande, the north where it crossed the desert in New Mexico, Arizona, California. And it will also include us paying them a small sum of money for the territory. That's about 530,000 square miles, almost one third of pre-war Mexico. And of course, we will take on a, somewhere between 75 and 100,000 Mexicans, as well as about 150,000 Native Americans who, as usual, we don't care about. We'll just kill them off and push them on their land later. But the question is, what do you do about these 75 to 100,000 Mexicans? How do you incorporate them? Well, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo determined just that. Remember our big debate back over our French white in the Louisiana Purchase? Well, the same issue comes up again. Are Mexicans white enough to become U.S. citizens? And according to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the answer is yes. Because the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo said, this is February 2nd, 1848, it said, hey, you 75 to 100,000 Mexicans, if you want to become U.S. citizens, you don't have to do anything but stay in the country. And as of January 1st, 1849, you can become U.S. citizens and you'll get to keep your land that you held before the war. If, however, you want to be Mexican, just get out, go back south of the Rio Grande, go back to your country, which again is racist, and you'll retain your Mexican citizenship. It's so you're given a choice. Now, on the one hand, this is giving blanket citizenship to a group of people who were, historically speaking, considered non-white. In fact, many white U.S. whites considered them a mix of, you know, Indian and white. So they were considered a mongrel race. And again, you're giving blanket citizenship to a non-English speaking group of people. But this is very important in history. Because to the present day, we still have this animosity and numerous stereotypes against people of Mexican descent, specifically Mexican Americans. But the reality is, in throughout history, we've considered Mexicans inferior, much like African Americans. We consider them a lower, different race at times. But the reality is, according to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexicans are legally white. Think about this. Remember back to 1790, the immigration law that said you cannot become a citizen unless you're white? I think this was done to bar Africans from becoming slaves. If, by well, that law is still in effect in 1848, if you must be white to become a citizen and Mexicans were granted citizenship in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that means all Mexicans are white, legally speaking. Now, of course, we know after this, Legally, they may be white, they may be citizens, but culturally, socially, economically, they will never be treated as equal. They will always be treated as first-class laborers, but second-class citizens. But now the question is, we have 530,000 square miles, almost one-third of pre-war Mexico. And of course, unfortunately for the Mexicans, the following year is when gold would be discovered in California. Think of how that could have helped Mexican government out. But the reality of all this new land, we've dealt with the people. Indians we don't care about. Mexicans can become citizens. But what do we do with this land? And more importantly, will this new land be slave or free? And that will be the topic of our next lecture. So until then, take care and bye-bye. <laughs>